Okay, guess what we're studying today? Hmm. Hmm. Not sure. This is message number 19, the series that we're in out of the book of Colossians. We're still in the first chapter. At least it's not 119 messages in the first chapter. And I don't want any of my listening audience to think we're really done with verse 19, although I will reference it today because we're moving into the 20th verse, but these two things, these two verses, in fact, the next couple of verses are all connected. We were looking at the fullness, that word fullness in verse 19, the pleroma, which is mentioned there in verse 19 for a purpose. We're told that it was uh, the good pleasure of the Father that in the Son of His love, all the fullness, everything basically that He is should dwell in Christ, all the fullness. And then when we start into verse 20, it says, "Having and having made peace through the blood of His cross, by Him to reconcile all things unto Himself. By Him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And here's what's interesting We're not only talking, we not only have been looking at what he created, all that he created, but all that is reconciled. So if you think about it, when it says regarding all things, all things, peppered throughout these verses, starting at about 15, moving your way down. So if he created all things, he has also reconciled all things. Now, I need to say a little footnote here because this is how people go off track. There are enough references in the Bible. And remember, I'm only interested in what's in this book. There are enough references to eternal punishment. As much as, you know, that's not a comfortable doctrine to talk about, but there's enough references if you were to start looking, Matthew 7, Matthew 11, Matthew 22, I'm 25, Mark 9, uh, Luke 12, it, there, there's so many of them that anybody who preaches that everything, although God in Christ was reconciling the world to himself, do not make the mistake that was made, for example, by origin. Uh, origin lived uh, 185 to 240 or 50 and of Alexandria. And basically he, he basically took the scripture as allegorical. There's a lot of wrong here, okay? But in his mind, he did not believe in the eternal suffering of sinners. That just could not be. A God of love would not be a God of love if he punished his creation. And obviously, and I'm going to say this with due respect, we're reading the whole book. We can see what Romans declares. The wrath of God is, if you understand the concept, not going to be appeased by somebody's view of God's love. That's not happening. Now, Origen propagated this which we now refer to as universalism. All will be saved. No one will be lost. That is heresy. Now, Origen often wrote about a concept in Greek called apokatastasis, which is basically restoration of all things. But that was an error, and I will explain why. So, okay, this doctrine is put out there in his day. By the 16th century, I should say, by the way, in 325 at the Council of Nicaea, this doctrine was condemned. It reared its head again over the ages. By the 16th century, Socinus and his son Faustus, that's the last name, Socinus, began to propagate this doctrine again and basically People latched on because if you don't understand theology and you talk about God's love, such a great loving God would not hurt his creation, not understanding that the Bible clearly says some were created for honor, 
some for dishonor. I can give you abundant references at the end of time where it says about the wheat and the tares will be gathered together at the time of the harvest. That's speaking about saved and unsaved. Gathered up, but they will be separated at some point. They're not gathered and taken together. So it's important to kind of point this out and make sure that no one thinks when I start talking about the word, which I'm going to spend a lot of time on, reconciliation or reconcile, I want nobody to think that I am preaching that every person will be saved. That is not so. Sorry, but that's what the Bible does indeed say. So let's kind of jump into our verse because that dwelling fullness actually plays into verse 20. Having made peace through the blood of his cross. The first thing that comes to my mind is having made peace. That is very suggestive of something. Having made peace tells me that there was variance, there was enmity, there was warring, there was discord. Having made peace. Right away there, there's the flag to tell you we were not okay. We were not. Creation was not okay. And creation, I'm speaking of everything in the creation. Now, reconciliation was not possible until the legal basis for it had been established. So kind of indulge me for a second, because I'm going to use a little bit of what goes on in the world combined with a little bit of uh, theological concepts to make my illustration. Imagine a just judge sitting on a bench in a court that is sworn to uphold the dignity of the law that cannot reconcile a guilty defendant until the demand of the law has been met and the debt is paid in full. The court must collect from the defendant defendant or the defendant's substitute, in our case, this is where it goes theological, until the case can officially be closed. Now, if a substitute can be found, it must be, that substitute must be willing to pay the debt that he or she, but in this case he himself, did not owe and must be qualified to pay the debt in full. Now, we're talking about God and we're talking about we who are essentially bankrupt, spiritually bankrupt. We don't have the capacity to pay the debt. He did. So now, of course, the application. He pays the debt. He's referred to in this uh, first chapter as the son of his love, Jesus. He and he alone paid the price. There are many theological words we could use. We could use a word like ransom, because he did. The whole of creation was being held hostage from the point of the fall until the day Christ died on the cross. We could use the word ransom, which I've taught on before. We could use the word as buying back a slave or a servant from off the block, the market. I've taught on many of these words. This concept of reconciliation, though, should not be confused with justification And I'll explain for those folks who, you know, maybe don't have the years of being here. Justification is a big, scary term, but just think of it this way. For my faith in Christ, God looks at me because I'm I'm looking to Christ for all of my needs. God looks at me as though I am just like him. I'm not. I, I know I'm not, but he sees me that way for my faith. It's not works. So... My position, my right standing with God is simply because of my faith in Christ. He imputes to me righteousness or justification, whichever term you want to use. Reconciliation, on the other hand, could not happen until something first, which is right here, having made peace through the blood of his cross. It tells you two things. Reconciliation could not happen until peace was made, And that peace came by his death. Just right there in the opening of this, it becomes abundantly clear, had Christ not laid down his life, we would still be in the same position. No hope, 
no possibilities. So this having made peace, kind of interesting. If you indulge me for just a second, I'm going to show you a parallel verse. And these are, it's important to me. Sometimes I think people listen and they think maybe I make this stuff up, but I don't. It's from the Bible. So in Ephesians 2 and verse 15, when it says, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. It goes on to say, And he came and he preached peace to you which are far off, and them which were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the... F- and in fact, read verse 19, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. So this act made something possible. I want to camp out on this because it's important. It's an, it's an important enough doctrine. I've touched on this before, but not like this. And I'm actually praying that this will have some type of an impact because a lot of times I read your mail. I read your letter. Some people say, well, how, do, how do I know or how do I understand what God is doing or what he's done. So I'm, I'm going to lay out a little bit of it today. Hopefully it'll make sense. But there's something immediately implied in this having made peace through the blood of his cross. It implies previous alienation, and God himself was never estranged, okay? Uh, nor does he need reconciling. So the means of our reconciliation, in the words having made peace, through the blood of his cross, we can know certain things from study just of the first chapter alone and maybe years of messages. Man by nature is at enmity with God. You know, a lot of people, you talk to them, they'll say, this God thing is so stupid, you know, why, why even bother? You have people who hate God, people who despise, who ridicule, who mock. Even if you don't ridicule or mock, you may have just a simple repulsion. Not interested, don't talk to me. I've met people like that. Oh, my goodness. Okay, what we know. Man by nature is at enmity, and our natural state is at enmity with God. God does desire to reconcile us back to him, even when we were strangers, aliens, separated from him, did not know him, or maybe we thought of him, but we never made anything beyond our thoughts. And... This is what's interesting. Once you start digging in reconciliation, you find some very awesome things. So here we go. Uh, From the dictionary, I used Merriam-Webster. I'll read to you what it says, and I know you're going to like at least one of these definitions. Here's what it says. The action of reconciling or a state of being reconciled. That's the first entry. The second one makes me shake my head. The Roman Catholic sacrament of penance has a concept of reconciliation, which I'm not even going to touch. And lastly, a reference to the U.S. government, a legislative process that enables expedited passages of a bill relating to certain matters in the federal budget by a simple majority of votes. That's also called reconciliation. (sighs) That did nothing for me. Sorry. Etymologically, the word reconciliation comes from reconcile, mid-14th century reference to persons to restore to union, to friendship after estrangement or variance. Then you, you kind of break it down a little bit more, and you get re and concile. And from that, again, we know that the, this prefix is again, usually, again, something repeated. And concile, which actually comes from com, with is with. And this word which actually comes to us from the Proto-Indo-European. This will make no sense for a minute. If you look in a Proto-Indo-European, uh, Proto-Indo-European dictionary, because everybody has one of those, we get from this kele, we get this word sile or the root of it, but we get our English words calorie or cauldron, which actually tends to 
have a concept of warmth, of energy and warmth. So when we use the term reconcile, it, it should carry with it, etymologically speaking, to come together with warmth. That's kind of the, the essence of it. But don't, don't go, oh, that's it right there, because there's more. Let's go to a new page, because this one actually excites me. All right. If you go to the Greek, here's where it gets good, and here's, here's where I get excited, okay? So this word reconcile, reconcile, reconciliation, in our text... You're going to actually have it appear in verse 20, to reconcile all things. In verse 21, he hath reconciled. And you'll find it in one other place, I believe, in the book of Ephesians. So this word, apokata, why did I, I wanted to write this in English for you, so forget about that. I want you to be able to read it. Apo, I know, kata, lasso, something like that. That's phonetic spelling. Now, let's do something fun here. Apo. And we're going to split that A. Wow. Okay. Apo. This, if you look up in the Strong's, off, away, but in a compound, and this is a compound, it's got multiple words put together, actually connotes completion or entirety. Then you take this word kata, Kata, okay, hold on a second. If you're a Strong's person, 575 for Apo. That is a book that contains every word that appears in the King James Bible that is put in numeric order. So if you're wondering, and I keep saying Strong's, that's what the Strong's is. In Strong's, Kata, 2596 is the number if you wish to look it up. This is usually used, and in this case, in a compound to denote Intensity. And here's the trick. This alasso, which comes to us from 236. This, I got to take time to explain. Alasso comes from a root, alos. And if you look that word up, it says to make otherwise, to alter or change. And I've got several references to where it is change, make different, exchange. So when you put this all together, it's tough because you're reading English and reconcile. When we, when we use the word reconcile, okay, I'm going to tell you the first thing I think of when I think of reconcile. I think of divorce and irreconcilable differences, right? You, can't, you, can, you cannot come together. That's your reason for, for splitting up. You cannot, there's no way you can see eye to eye. That's kind of the way we use that word. So to reconcile would be both parties coming together and both perhaps acknowledging culpability or guilt and agreeing to have peace and then to become in unison again, whatever that is, a broken friendship, marriage, whatever. But here's the problem. Reconciliation or to reconcile in the Bible, specifically in the New Testament and specifically within our text, can only go one way, can only be used one way. See, God is reconciling us and all the creation to him, but he himself does not need to be reconciled because he's not guilty or culpable of anything. So that's the first place where it's different. But now take this word and add something more, I think almost mind-boggling which is, yes, this word carries with it the concept of reconciliation, but it also does something else. It essentially is saying, because of his act of laying down his life, of dying, the death he died, and because of my faith, the activity that he does in reconciling me to him, also from that last part, alasso, with intensity and completely, gives some other meaning to this word as well, which is to change. To change you and to change me. Now, let me explain this a little bit, because otherwise people will go off on different... Okay, why, does, why did Paul take the time to tell us that here we have the creator of everything? He created it all. Well, we know in the story of creation and thereafter, 
everything was marred from the fall. We tend to not think we know of us how we were altered with Adam and Eve's issues and fall. But we don't necessarily think about why Paul was itemizing heaven that he, if he made all things. Remember I had a message here where I pointed out all of the different potentially angelic hosts in there? Do you think he put that in there for fun? No, when he says that these were all created, everything, the heavens, the earth, you, me, all created by him, marred in the act of sin that occurred in Genesis 3, and from that day forward, the blueprint of man and creation is stuck in a fallen image. Okay? Now, imagine that when I cataloged all of those, for by him were all things created that are in heaven, in earth, visible, invisible, whether be thrones, dominions, principalities. The reason that's in there as well is to let us know that, for example, when the morning star, when the chief musician, I will go, I will be like God. I remember that, I taught on that out of Ezekiel and Isaiah. We have basically this chief crowning cherub puffed up in pride. I will be like God. I will, I will, I will. I, 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 I. And ultimately, we don't stop to think about, we we know we were defiled in the fall. And yes, there were fallen angels. He took a third with him. When he fell, he took a third of that host with him. Now, if these were created or made, they too, not all, but they too must have the ability to be reconciled. Think of this. The creatures that God created. Now, I know there's people that say, oh, God didn't make that. They evolved. Oh, good luck. <laughs> Speak for yourself if you want to talk about evolution. You may be a product of evolution. <laughs> but I want you to think about this. The animals. No, the creation in its entirety was marred and changed, which means animals that were never created to kill other animals are now killing other animals to eat. God did not create, you can say what you want, but just even taking a passage out of Isaiah, when we hear about the restoration and the reconciliation and what God has promised to do, where do we get the idea the lion will lay down with the lamb or the wolf with the sheep? That's out of uh, Isaiah 11. Where do we get this idea? Well, if you think about it, we were not the only ones marred. So the necessity of reconciling all things, including the itemization here of things that are in heaven that we don't see and the things on earth, which some of them we don't see, he had to reconcile them, but don't just think about bringing them back to him. See, if there's something, let's go with the creation. If there's something marred, let's take the animal kingdom. Something marred within that kingdom, he could reconcile and basically bring them back to him, but he'd have to do one thing. He would have to basically change that entity to make it have peace once more with him. Does that make sense to you? So a change must occur. Now, please don't get this confused with any other theological concept. This one actually kind of, it it makes me happy when I read about this. Because, you know, people have asked me, well, the scripture talks about we are new creatures in Christ Jesus. How do we get to be new creatures? Because I still look like the old one. We have been reconciled. He, while I was still estranged and alien at variance, He basically brought me to himself, preveniently acting, while I did not know that he was doing it. Now, where I have the option is free will. My eyes were open, and I freely accepted or freely acknowledged. And a change began in that process. You know, let me see a show of hands. Do not put cameras on people. How many people know Something has changed in you since you became a Christian. Something. Okay. 
this is what we're talking about. This, this one word ties in. It's not, it doesn't operate on its own. I want you to think there's the operation of the air bone, the deposit of the Holy Spirit. There is the process I've described of sanctification, of justification, or, or being righteousified. Here is another one of these to put into, we'll call it your spiritual wallet. When people say, well, how has somebody changed? Well, it's the power of God, but it's, it's through this method. It essentially is the genesis. It's the only way for us to forgive the terminology for a minute, for us to, to be friends again. But see, I was not a friend of God. I, I, I was delusional when I first, you know, in my early years, I, I thought I was. But then if I'm a friend of God, I wouldn't have kind of treated God like he's on the back burner. It doesn't matter. I would have been interested in this book. I would have not wasted the time. So you, you kind of get the idea that when God has his time giving you, we'll call it space enough to see what you don't know, and you start learning what you don't know, you then realize you don't know what you don't know, you begin to understand there's a whole field of things in this book to help me understand how I have become a new creature, that I'm not, even though I may look the same to you, I'm no longer bound by that old container. No, I've been set free in Christ. Now, there are many places where we have the word changed or exchanged. But let me just tell you that all of the other references you're going to find in the Bible of reconciliation or reconciled will, will simply be catalasso, okay? So there's many of these, many times in many places. I, if I'm not mistaken, Romans 123. Yes, there's another use of it right there and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man, changed or exchanged, you've got the same concept. Now, you won't have, as I said, this word, apokatalasso, appears twice in Colossians, once in Ephesians, and then variant without the apo that says completion. So you know you're seeing an intensified completion of a change that happened to you or to me, that is not just simply a mere, we're just, we're going to hold hands now and walk down the street like we're good friends. It's very subtle. When people start to recognize, really think about the magnitude of what God has done to make it possible for us, this is why I get offended when people treat God like, oh, it's Christmas or it's a holiday, let's go to church. Instead of saying, I need to get serious because there will be a day where I will have to give an answer. All of us. You, know, you can run, you can hide. But let me tell you what without reconciliation looks like. And I'll give you an example. When God created, let us make man, Adam, in our image. And they had perfect communion till the fall. What's the first, one of the first things Adam did after the fall? He went away from God. He hid himself from God. He wanted to get as far away from God as he could. That's what a non-reconciled mindset does. Stay away from me. Get away from me. I don't want, even though you're talking to, you're talking to the creator. That's the first issue, why we needed to have peace made and how we would be brought back. Without that, if you start cataloging everything that Adam and Eve did after that point, you realize this is why we needed to be reconciled back by him, but peace had to be made first. And he did that by going to the cross, laying down his life. That spilled blood. Listen, this whole book from cover to cover, speaks of sacrifice. There's a lot of people that they shun away from this idea. It's not an idea. God said it's necessary. If you read the Old Testament, the whole book of Leviticus is the prescription for how to approach God, whether it would be for sin offerings, peace offerings, doesn't matter. And every, save the ones that are with grain, 
most of the offerings were blood offerings. And you realize what the book of Hebrews in the New Testament picks up, that the blood of bulls and goats could not clear and cleanse the conscience, the heart, the mind, only one sacrifice, which is why, behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. So it, it, becomes, it becomes clear to me that this concept of reconciliation, which I have notes in my Bible from the last time I may have spoken on this, which could have been years ago, I actually went to find another Bible and found the same highlighted passage. So I know I've talked about this word many times. But never has a word, I'm telling you, never has a word gripped me with such fascination. Because here's the other thing. He did all this reconciling to himself. Doesn't mean that everyone will respond. You see, that's the heresy of universalism. Whether people respond or not, God will, he'll save them all. That's not the way God works. His book reveals it. So when he says, for example, 2 Corinthians 5.18, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, it means he did all that. He has made peace through the cross, through, through his death. But then let's go back to something taught out of Ephesians, that God chose certain people out of a group of people that he did not choose. He chose out from among those who weren't chosen to take to himself. That becomes the church, a people who belong to the Lord, that he begins to work his will on and not against your will. He's given you the free will to think about it and say yea or nay. So this thrills my soul for many reasons, and I'm going to try and catalog them. So for this... I'd like you to turn to Romans 5 with me. So Romans 5 really tells you a great deal about this same subject. Now, just let me highlight just verse 10 for a second, then I'll read other, other parts. 5.10 says, For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled shall we be saved by his life. Now, this is what I'm talking about doctrine. I can find it in many different places. It's sound doctrine. Reconciliation is sound doctrine. But something subtle being said here in verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God, it means that while Melissa Scott was out there in the world and before she came into the church... God had already reconciled me. I want that one over there, and I want that one over there, and, and I want that one over there, and I want this God. I want that one over there. That one's mine. That one's mine. That one's mine. You may have not thought about it, but that's God's prevenient grace acting before you even knew it. Which means that I'm going to speak for myself now. I didn't make a decision. You hear people, I made a decision for Christ. Now, you, as I said, free will, don't get me wrong. But you don't start off making a decision for Christ. You start off by, most of us, nudges, things that you think in your mind, well, I, I ought to, you somehow find yourself kind of like a person who's in a dark room trying to find where the light switch is. You know you've got to find the light switch, but you're, kinda, you're in a dark room, and you just, just about a foreign dark room. Feel around until you feel, oh, there's, there's a light switch now. Which, which button do I press? Kind of like that. While you think you have found the light switch, the light already found you. Without this concept, you, don't, you or I cannot even grab hold of the supremacy of God over humankind. You're not an accident. I'm not an accident. I'm not here because there were no better choices. That's the other thing. You know, when you start studying this and you really are taking it in, you realize something. God had a plan. So when I'm talking about this, why it thrills my soul is that God had a plan before I could even conceive of hearing the message of the resurrection. Now, 
here's where it's not all wound up and unfolds. I still had the choice. I could have chosen. Screw that. <laughs> who wants to be in a church every Sunday? Who wants to, who wants to, you know, I had all kinds of really weird ideas, much like many of you. You're going to lose your identity. They're going to, they're going to, brainwash you. Something's going to happen. You're not going to be yourself. You're, you're going to become one of those church people. <laughs> no, in fact, let me just tell you, I am more me today than I have ever been. And that's why I said, don't come in here and expect me to talk to you in stained glass tones and sound, oh, holy brethren and sister. Blah, blah. That's not me. What you get here, what you see is what you get. I'm human just like you. I goof off just like you. I do stupid things just like you. We're all the same. The only difference here is I'm telling you, I recognize, looking back now, God, while I was still an enemy out there, looking back, God had reconciled me already. And the peace that he made at the cross didn't become evident to me until my eyes were open, and then all of a sudden, a battle to understand began. How many of you went through that frustration of not understanding? Why does God want me? Why am I here? Did anybody go through that? I'm the only one. (laughs) Thank God. Otherwise, you think, pastor's a nut job. So let me get back to the text then. There are concepts that we have to take hold of. In, For example, in Romans 5.10, and I stay there for just a second longer, denotes a decisive change. Listen, for if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled shall we be saved by his life. Not only so, but we also joy in God. There's a big gap, there's a big gap there between being enemies and then suddenly being joyful about God or joy in God. So there has been a decisive change. That's number one. This change is not merely a disposition of an individual, nor his legal relationship to God, but a total state of his or her life. That's something to smile about. You see, much of Christianity, I've used the illustration like this, much of Christianity says, you must produce fruit. And most of Christendom spends the time like you're a dead tree and they hang the plastic fruit on your branches and say, see, fruit. But that's not God's doing. So here, take the same application. A change of disposition, a change of standing, and a change of state in my life, yet I did not create that. I didn't do it. I just had to start trusting, hearing by faith and trusting. Now, much like, I'm still in Romans, so forgive me for that for a minute, because we are in the book of Colossians, but there could be no better uh, text right now to deal with. If you look, start with me at the fifth verse, and now read down with me. When it says, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. That's me and you, without strength. I was out there, you were out there. He died for the ungodly. But God commendeth his love toward, towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood. That's the same thing being said in our text. We shall be saved from wrath through him. So I point this out for another reason. The wrath of God, you know, I think a lot of times it's either made into a caricature, is a reality. Let me see if I can find an illustration that will kind of meet me halfway. Well, any one of you fathers that have children, that went through children from a very young age, you know, you brought them into the world, Let's just say that you, wanna, you wanted to raise your children with a little bit more sternness so they're not unruly and all over the map. And you have house rules. And whatever your house rules are that you've decided under your roof, you want the child to obey and do, you establish. Now, you've provided for this child. You, 
you brought it into the world. Now, God created, but you brought it into the world. You have provided housing, bed, food. And all you ask for is, hey, listen, these are my parameters. Please stay within them. Right? You probably don't say please. Just say these are the parameters. Okay, got it? Good. Now, what happens if again and again, I could understand one time, maybe two times, but again and 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 again, your child has blatant disregard for what you've said is important and matters to you under your roof. At some point, there's going to be, we'll call it a, a disconnect, and discord sets in, and then ultimately there is no, there can't be peace in that environment. Now, God set out in his house, which is the world, and he set out with basically just a few rules, and those rules are not really rules. He just wanted to be trusted and taken at his word. And our first parents, Adam and Eve, did not do that. So when we talk about the, the byproduct, the unraveling of all of creation, it makes me smile, it makes me happy that God provided a way, and not some where I have to bring and slay a goat or a bull and repeatedly do this over and over again, but one perfect sacrifice, and all I have to do is look at that one perfect sacrifice and say, that was done for me. And I keep looking and realize that one sacrifice made peace for me that I might become, and forgive my terminology, but to make my speech flow, that I might become a friend of God instead of an enemy. So this is a very powerful word for me, especially with the knowledge of how many people, when you mention God or talk about God, it's, oh, oh, that should give you a sense, not just of what God has done, but what he continues to do. So now let's turn back to our text in Colossians, because I'm not done. All right. So the next question that I'm, some of you may ask, not all of you, but some of you may ask, and I think I've answered it already, but I'll ask the question, is reconciliation active or passive? Well, I just answered it, but in case you're not sure, and there's a little twist, reconciliation is done by God, so we are passive in that. But once we have been reconciled and we have been brought back again into fellowship, and we have been, by some degree, changed into a new creature, something else happens, and that is we become active, actively reconciled. In other words, he still did all the work, but now I, I become activated. Or put it to you this way, I was like a dead container before, and because he reconciled me, he made peace through the blood of it, he died for me, and because he did this, he did this act of reconciling me and bringing me to him, now I become actively reconciled. I'm, I'm energized. So if somebody says, well, then tell me about the extent or the scope of this reconciliation. Let me go back to the text that talks about all things. See, we only view the fall in terms of humankind. But the need to say that he created what's in the heaven and on earth, visible, invisible, thrones, principalities, tells me the reconciliation work that he had to do was everything that he created, he had to reconcile back to him. Think about that for a second, because we're very myopic in our, in our view of God. We just we actually are very self-centered. We only think it's just us. But I spoke about the animal kingdom. How is it, and you may say, well, Isaiah was just simply being poetic about all this. He, he liked poetry. No, he was a prophet. How is it that he, Isaiah, when he says, for example, and righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, he says, oh, sorry, wrong verse, the wolf shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lay down with the kid, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and the little child shall lead them, we know who that is, the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lay down together, the lion shall eat straw like the ox." The lion shall eat straw like the ox. It means that there will also be a reconciliation, which has not yet happened, entirely of the whole creation that did not ask to be subjected. You want to know 
where that is in the Bible, Romans 8, sorry to take you back there again. Read Romans 8 or write, and you'll find that Paul, he lays that out right there in Romans 8. He says, verse 20, For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected in the, the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption and the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. That verse 20, that very key word, was made subject to vanity, not willingly, says everything suffered because of Adam and Eve. And everything must be reconciled. But do not think that that means all will be saved. It means God did his part. Now, to ferret out, the diversity of peoples who will, what does the Bible say, whosoever will, come, I shall in no wise cast out. In one of the passages in John, he says, other sheep I have not of this fold. Why did he tell his disciples not to go to a certain place, don't go to the house of Israel, and then go to the house of Israel. Don't go to Samaria, and then they went to Samaria. Well, then they're told to go to Samaria, and they went. It's almost as though God has an order. No, he does for all things. And when we begin to read this order, we recognize, hey, I didn't just, my salvation and my being here is not an accident, nor is yours. So, the extent or scope of reconciliation is all things. The object of reconciliation, all creation, everything created. The result, there are those who will be reconciled, brought brought back to or brought into fellowship, and there will be those who will not. Now, when we talk about humankind, very interesting. We could talk about the animal kingdom, but the animals can't talk to us. We could talk about heaven, but the best we can do is say that it too, if you think about it, had been tainted by the fall. The fall of Satan, or the fall of Lucifer, and then subsequently after that, the fall, the fall fall, Genesis 3. So it goes without saying. Don't just think when I've talked about God's going to recreate and he's going to do all this, what he's already done, and then scratch your head and figure out, well, oh, yeah, I, I am different. I'm, you know, if you look back from the me today and maybe look back 30 years ago, you'd say, yeah, of course I'm different. I've, Changed a lot. I've changed in many I have changed in many ways, but I never tried to change. That's the interesting thing. Well, think of it this way. There may have been people who thought, once I become a Christian, now I have to act this way and I've got to talk this way. That's, that's another one of those things. When I hear people actually talking like that, I, I have to go the other way. Not because I'm anti-God, because I'm anti-hypocrisy. I don't want people pretending and playing at being a Christian. If you're going to be a Christian, be one. If you're going to be in this book, take God at his word. I love these people that say, well, I'm a Christian, but, you know, I don't agree with everything in the Bible. Oh, okay. So, basically, you're not a follower of Christ. See, there's a lot of things I may be confounded with that I may not... You know, somebody said to me, well, did the sun really stand still? Well, I don't know, but when you're standing before God, you can ask him yourself. Well, that's impossible. Well, there are a lot of things that are impossible. People don't walk on water, and they don't come back from the dead, and they don't change water into wine. I could give you lots of examples of things that happen. Well, that's not possible. Well, if you're God, it is, and you're not, (laughs) and neither am I. You have to kind of think that way. So what I want to leave you with today is kind of a a good thought. Think about this. I want you to, I'm going to read through this again. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell, stay, abide, remain. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, his death made peace for us to reconcile all things unto himself By him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you and me and anyone else in the sound of my voice that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, 
Yet now he hath reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. I pray God will give me the wisdom to explain verse 22 properly so we can dispel with people thinking what holy, unblameable, it will not happen in this lifetime. Holy, yes, you're separated to God, not the way people describe it, but I hope to be able to explain that in a way where you can actually latch on to it and not think, well, how could I be unblameable and unreprovable in his sight? And I'll tell you about that as we continue in the series, but right now I want to tell you something even more remarkable. And I think I'm going to speak for a lot of people in the sound of my voice. It becomes clear if you're reading the scriptures. Many times, even people have come into the church and they kind of drift away. There's a passage out of Isaiah that says, your sins basically have made a separation between you and your God. And this is why I tell you, this is something you can only do for you and I can only do it for me. And it is not effective. Sorry, James is the only person in the Bible who says, tell somebody. The only person you need to talk to is God. It means in your prayer time, and if you can find time to be on social media several hours a day, you can certainly find five minutes to talk to God. Hello. To sit down, and instead of barging in to ask God if he can bestow you with the latest, greatest bling or whatever it is you want from him, maybe you sit down and kind of just talk to God. Maybe you tell him today, maybe I wasn't such a good child. Maybe today I didn't. And you, you speak for yourself. I can't speak for you. And I can tell you there have been many days where I've sat quietly and talked to God thinking, he must be very disappointed in me because at the end of the day, I failed him miserably. I have many days like that. That doesn't make me bad or evil. It makes me honest with God. And that's all he wants. He wants, he already knows that I've made a mess or I've messed up or he knows my heart towards him. He wants me to tell him, to talk. It's like, it's like being in a relationship and, you know, after a while you stop telling the person I love you because it's, it's just assumed. We're together and you know I love you. Well, you don't say it anymore versus telling your significant other and on a regular basis because it's real and not assuming they know now, we spend a lot of time assuming God knows. He does. But he wants to hear from us. That really, to me, begins the prayer life. Not, sorry, not confession to other people. I can't even understand, and I'm going to be honest with you, to my Catholic friends, I don't even understand how you would breach the trust that has been given to you to speak to another human being before you speak directly to God. You're not speaking to God when you're speaking to another person. They, Christ may be in them, but you are not speaking to God. And nothing will ever substitute. Nothing will ever take the place. So here's the question, last one. Somebody might say, well, then why do people do it? Well, because they think that that's what they're supposed to do. They've been brought up into it. They've been conditioned by mind, not by the book conditioned by habits and conditioned by customs and conditioned by society. And this is the way we do things. Therefore, this is the way we keep doing it. Instead of asking the question, why am I talking to a person with a screen between me instead of on my knees or on my bed or I don't care, wherever you are, in your car, talking to God? Because he's the one listening. And he's the one that cares because he's the one that bought you back in the first place, reconciled you so that peace is po possible and decided, forgive my term again, he wants to be friends with you, even though, let's just, I'll put it on me, even though I don't deserve his friendship, I don't deserve his proximity, I don't deserve any of that. He says, I did this so I could draw you to me. Now, are you listening? Because I got something really good to tell you. Not only did I bring you to myself, but I started a work in you that will... Think about the scriptures, to be conformed to the image and likeness 
of his dear son. Well, how, how do we get that? Well, in the process of reconciliation, by the work of the Holy Spirit, and with God's hand like the potter working on the clay, I shall be molded. I shall be. And what I am right now may not look like much in the eyes of the world, but I have a treasure in this earthen vessel given to me for what the reason, except I can say only by his grace. That makes me a grateful heart and makes me desirous to know more about what he has done for me and the rest of creation. So if you're at all interested, I hope the concept of reconciliation, which I've just touched on, haven't gone deeper, will help you to understand God has done an incredible work already. When people complain about, well, God hasn't done this or done that, are you crazy? Otherwise, you wouldn't be here, neither would I. So think on these things and think about this. If you and I fit into the category of verse 21, alienated and enemies, can you imagine? I mean, it's kind of mind-boggling. Can you imagine I'm down here on earth and I'm going to now make a a caricature? God's up there in heaven looking down at me, Melissa Scott. Oh, that scoundrel, that enemy, a traitor. Okay? And all of a sudden, he says, but I want her. He takes me to himself. And from that moment, as I'm looking to him, change begins to happen. Change that I'm not doing on my own. And it's not a change that will make me somebody else. It will make me the me he intended me to be for him. And that's what he's doing for you. And that's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.